little Metallica there for you. Welcome back to the Section 304 podcast. Drink your beers, talking ears, as always. That'll get you going on a Sunday morning, a little Metallica. Joining us here on the phone, Mr. Kevin Pitsnoggle. What's happening, Kev? What's going on? You know, just uh, living the dream, man, living the dream. Um, thanks, First of all, thanks for coming on the show. You're actually our first basketball guest. Last year, um, we we did a lot of – we had guests every week on the football show and thought we would have too much to talk about during basketball season, and we didn't do the basketball guests. But So thank you for being our first basketball guest on the Section 304 podcast. Oh, not a problem. Well, first, let's let's catch Mountaineer Nation up. What's what's been going on with you, man? Um, obviously, you you know you've you've kept, we've talked. I've kept in touch with you, and you you've lived a pretty private life, and um, you don't really talk too much about what's going on with you uh, publicly. So, just what's been going on on uh, in your world? Oh, not too much. I mean, I kind of stay to myself and kind of just take care of my own life. I guess you would say. Um, more or less, mainly just been uh, working and uh, coaching my kids in sports, and just kind of enjoying that life. You uh, obviously, um, and, and well, let's let's talk a little bit about post WVU first, because obviously, and then we'll go back and talk about some things during your basketball career at West Virginia. Um, after you left West Virginia, you went to Boston for a while, and and then you went where? Kind of tell us what happened right after you graduated. Right after I graduated, um, ended up in, I guess, Boston for a little while, then ended up just kind of jumping around a um, bunch of different places from, uh, you know, went over to France for a little bit and then ended up in Pittsburgh and um, just kind of traveled around and played at much different, I guess you would call it like minor league places and uh, did a bunch of traveling. Nice. Um And obviously, what was the experience like in Boston? I mean, you know, when the Celtics call – that's not um, that's not the Charlotte Hornets or the you know that's that's a legendary organization. Um, what was it like? Just even, oh, I, it was yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, we got an opportunity to visit the city and just kind of get a get an idea of their obviously their pastimes and uh, had a great opportunity to, to try out for their team and uh, to be a part of it for a little bit and um, it just didn't work out in the end. But it was a great time while I was there. Hey Kevin, this is John. I was going to ask you what what was it like playing in Europe, and what what was your favorite spot over there? Um, I mean, it was, it was fine. It's just so different um, as far as the lifestyle goes. I mean, it was a good time getting getting a chance to kind of see some different cultures and experience different things. But as far as um, just living there and doing different uh, aspects of life, it, it becomes harder um, than what you're used to. Obviously, if it's not what you're used to. <laughs> All right, let's t- let's talk about. West Virginia, and uh, and walk us through this because it, when you think about it, when you think back about uh, your time there, obviously people think a lot about the runs through the NCAA tournaments. But you were not recruited by by John Beeline. No, I was actually signed by Gail Kettler, um when he was still there. So, what was the transition like? Because and I was there at the time too, but. Walk us through Gail's resignation, the Dan Dockage thing, and then obviously landing with, uh, you know, because because you were coming out of high school, was it up in the air for you at that time? What what was it like for you then? Um, well, I mean, at the time we took Catlett, um, and he had actually resigned at the end of the year, um, with everything going on, and then I was actually, of course, I was in uh, Greece. No, yeah, I was in Greece playing in some tournament or Germany, one somewhere in Europe playing in some tournament, and I found out that they had signed Dan Dockage to be the coach. And he actually called me while I was overseas uh, playing on a high school overseas team, and uh, told me he was the coach. And when I came back, he would be there, and we would talk. And I said, "Okay." Well, when I came back, I got a phone call from the university stating that he was no longer the coach. They were still looking for a coach, and then that's when I found out they found. Coach Beeline, and then once he got signed in to be the coach, he actually came down to Martinsburg and talked to me and convinced me that I would be a good fit for his offense. So I just decided to stay there. You know, um, Beeline, or I'm sorry, John, or Gail Catlett, you know, playing in that center position, 
you were not your conventional center. Um, so do you think that you fared well, you fared, fared better in the John Beeline system? Can you just talk about, do you ever think back to that and think, oh, I wonder what it would have happened if Catlett would have stuck around? Yeah, I mean, I, I think back and I talk to other people about it, and I, I feel like um, what happened with uh, Coach Beeline being there, and, and I, I kind of got lucky um, with the system I ended up being in and the, the situation. It couldn't have been a better fit for me. So uh, I don't know if I would have had the same type of career under Catlett. I just can't say that for sure. Um, but I definitely couldn't find a better fit than what I had. That's for sure. Hey, Kevin. At a certain point, what what at what point did it click with with you guys? You guys had a core group: uh, Collins, uh, Gansey, and and Sally, Hair Bear. yourself, Hair Bear, and then Patrick Beeline. At what point did it click? And you were like, if if we keep this thing together, we're we're probably going to win a lot of ball games. I mean, I think we started realizing it my sophomore year, which was the year Gansey had came in, but wasn't able to play. Um. He had to sit out the first year, which was my sophomore year. And we knew in practice that if we, we could get all of us on the same page and play together, and we could be a pretty good group of guys. Now, I mean, we didn't assume we would do as well as we did, but we knew we could win some games. The, I guess, historically looking back at it, I guess would you say it was the Pittsburgh game that kind of – blew the thing open your junior year. I believe it was at Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly. Would would you say that's the game that really kind of blew it open for you guys and kind of set the set the, the ball in motion, got the wheels in motion for that historical run? Yeah, I would say that was probably like the, the I guess, the beginning of it for us. Um, it was, I guess, towards the end of the year. And we just um, we had won some games, lost some games, but – that kind of got us into the, the 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 momentum, I guess, we needed for the end of the year. Hey, Kevin, what about whenever you sit down with your kids and you watch Sports Center and you see Chris Paul highlights and you're just like, I, do you just say, "Hey, your your old man beat that guy in the tournament"? Um, no, nah, I mean, we don't really talk about it much. Um, uh, we, every once in a while, we'll turn it on, we'll see some things, and. But I don't really bring up too much about it, and uh, I don't say a whole lot about it. Speaking of, um, I remember that game playing Wake. What I mean, obviously, because we beat St. Bonaventure, was it the first round? Creighton. Creighton, okay. So you beat Creighton, and you're you're going against Wake. Um, Kind of talk talk to us a little bit about going into that game. What do you remember – just the, the the feeling in the room. Uh, did you got were you guys confident? Were you just like, hey, let's just give this thing a shot? What what was it like? Because obviously um, Wake was on fire at that point. Yeah, I mean the biggest thing I remember is that everybody talking about them being the fifth number one seed it's because they, they obviously ended up with number two seed that that year, and we everybody thought they should have been number one seed, and they ended up in our bracket as a number two. So we just called them the fifth number one seed, and. Uh, yeah, we weren't exactly excited, I guess, to play against them, but I mean, we, we knew we had a chance with the style of play that we could beat anybody because our offense was so hard to get ready for in just a matter of a day or two. So I knew we we knew we had a chance, but it's just a matter of us. It was a matter of us making shots and making the right plays. You think that um, you think the the run in the Big East tournament the year or the you know leading in that kind of just carried over into the NCAA tournament. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think when you get on that kind of run and you're playing that well, even when it's a loss in the championship game that year, I think we still had the momentum we needed to go into the, to go into the NCAA tournament and play against any team. And we knew if we could compete in the Big East, you can, at that time, you could compete with anybody. I'm going to ask you, Kevin, um, this year, if, have you watched us much this year? Or? I've watched a couple games here and there. We're not very good at free throw shooting, frankly. <laughs> if you had any advice for our guys on how to improve their free throw shooting, because you're an outstanding three point shooter and free throw shooter, what, how how would you coach them up? What would you tell them? Get in the gym and practice. That's the only way you're gonna make them. Yeah. I mean, you can you can you can do what you want, say what you want, but I mean, the only way to get it done is by putting the time in. You know, um, speaking of just getting in the gym and practicing. 
you know, you obviously were coached by John Beeline. Um, I, I've got some interesting John Beeline. So I was obviously not around coach as much as you were. What do you remember about him? What are some things that you maybe still to this day, you, are there lessons that maybe he taught you or something that he taught you that you still use in your day-to-day life today? I mean, uh, I think basketball in general, as you're growing up, is, is a huge life lesson. Um, and you can take a lot of things you learn in sports and, and then put it into your regular everyday life now. Um, and the biggest thing for, I mean, especially for college, you're in there putting a lot of time in and, and you're around these guys and the coaches are great. I mean, I don't think you can find too many top basketball coaches that don't put a lot of time and effort into the student athletes, not just for basketball purposes, but for their life purposes. Right. And, uh, even to this day, I could call Coach Beeline and ask for advice, and he'd be more than happy to give it to me. So just to, just to have that as a mentor and to be able to always have somebody to yell at if you need it, it's always a great thing to have. Uh, Kevin, it's been over 10 years, but looking back on it, um, looking at where West Virginia basketball was when you signed in, in 2002 – to 2017 I mean what are your thoughts on that I mean we, we're pretty uh, much ranked and and we've we've won a decent amount of games since since the uh, 05 season what are your thoughts on that well I'm just happy to be a part of the beginning of it it was nice to be a part of the turnaround part of it um we we got to go through a pretty rough season my freshman year sophomore year wasn't the greatest season. I think we got to the NIT tournament that year but to be a part of the beginning of the turnaround process was a great feeling. Um, now all these guys that are winning every year um, are, are part of a winning program every single year that they get to play there. They don't get to experience the ups and downs. And uh, there, there was a lot of experiences in, in, in those downs that helped me, not only in basketball, but in life. So it, it was nice to be able to experience that with the group of guys that we had. I know you were, you, and you just said it earlier, you don't talk a whole lot about it, but um... – you know, what was it like for you being a West Virginia guy and being able to stay home and and represent and, and be the building block to what we see today? Because let's just, let's just be blunt, if it wasn't for that group that you went through today, I don't think West Virginia basketball would be what it is today. So being a home a homeboy, what was it like? What's it like for you to look back at it now? Um, I mean, to be honest, at the time I was going through it, I didn't care. Um, it didn't really – mean anything other than I was just playing basketball and having fun. Um, I mean, but now to be able to look back on it and be, being from West Virginia and having a different outlook, um, it, it definitely means a lot to me to be able to say I was a part of that group and that I'm from West Virginia and I was able to help turn around the, the obviously the one of the biggest things in the state um, because we don't have a pro team. That is our pro team as West Virginians um, to be able to look at. You know, obviously – I remember um, the end of the run. Um, talk about that core group of guys, because um, I went through. You guys were went through when I was there, and that was a tight knit group of guys that was actually kind of almost thrown together. If you kind of look back at it, because JD Collins didn't even commit until almost like July or June or July, and he came to school in in August. Um, you know, Patrick ended up being there because of his dad being the coach. Not that he didn't z- deserve it, but that's the reason why he ended up at West Virginia. Um, but at the end of it, you guys were a tight knit group of guys. Um, can you just talk about the the chemistry and the friendships? And do you still keep in touch with some of those guys? Um, yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, we built a great relationship while we were there, and we did we did a lot of great things, and we was able to get close. And I think that's what helped us on the floor. Um, is that we were such good friends off the floor. Um, it just kind of you kind of moved into the to the basketball aspect, and it helps. I mean, and you'll see it with any team that's good. They're usually friends and stuff off the court. You don't have a bunch of people fighting. But um, as far as keeping up with everybody today, everybody's so busy. Um, we do keep in touch here and there um, when we when we have time. But I think seventy five to eighty percent of the people I play with are all coaching in the college ranks or somewhere else right now. So right. they stay pretty busy, and uh, we we all have our own lives to kind of run around with. But yeah, when we when we get a chance, we get a chance to talk and uh, here here and there. And I have to ask you when you when you hear the term, you've been pit snoggled. What do you what do you think about what do you think about that? That was a a hell of a an interesting term that came about, but uh, the, the yeah. state of West Virginia embraced it, and we knew what that meant when you've been pit snoggled. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, for for friends and family, for me personally, I'm not the type of person that likes 
any type of thing like that. I just never had really gotten into sayings and showboating and saying stuff like that. So I just kind of step away from it and stay away from it. Very cool. Well, Kevin, man, thanks for coming on. I know uh, you stay busy. Uh, I, I see you. Uh, we're friends. We're Facebook friends on Facebook, and and I try to keep up in touch with you. And I see you coaching and and doing your thing. And and um, I guess there'll be some other announcements, and uh, we'll be hearing more from you later. But uh, but thanks for coming on. It's always good to catch up with you. Um, if, hopefully, we can get you back down to Charleston soon. We can we can catch up. But uh, I just, yes, sir. I appreciate you taking time and joining us here on the show. And I'm sure the people here in West Virginia that they still love you, you know, that, and, um, and, uh, but it, they'll be excited to hear from you. Well, I appreciate it. All right, brother. Take care. I'll be in touch. Thanks. You too. All right. Here it is. Kevin Pitsnoggle. And, and I was telling you, just kind of, he's still, he doesn't, he never really got caught up in the, I don't, I still to this day don't think he realizes how much he's loved here in the state. He never got caught up. You heard what he said about right. that. He just never got caught up in it. That's he's better it. man than me if every time the Clipper highlights would come on, if, <laughs> if that was me, I'd be like, hey, yeah, I send him home early. <laughs> yeah, so, you, I mean, um, but when you think back at that, man, I mean, and we probably didn't even dive into half the stuff. I meant that I should ask him about the UCLA games because those are probably my two. Oh, yeah. The two biggest victories probably won. Well, yeah, his, his team beat him out there. Yeah. He, <laughs> <coughs> they, Excuse me. That was yeah. That was great. They great beat wins. them in, at UCLA. Then they came back to Morgantown next year and beat them. Um, big wins against. Uh, there was some big tournament wins, uh, knocking off um, Villanova, um, and you know, and Boston College was tough back in those days. Too. Oh yeah, Boston College was tough. The I remember the the game where I thought we had a pretty good team was they beat NC State down there. Yes. NC State at Julius Randall. And they were in the top twenty five, and we yeah. we beat them on the road, and I think I think we started ten and zero that year. Yeah, but like you know, and I didn't even mention it. It was an interesting hodgepodge of guys that kind of right. just got thrown together. Um, you know, that first year, Drew Shafino was there. Tyron and Sally were the only guys. Sally they, was a holdover from Catlett. Yeah, then they bring in like a Dior Fisher who gives you two solid years. I think he ended up being like the block leader at the, before he left mm-hmm. in two years. And it was uh it was just kind of strange the way it all kind of came together. And then all of a sudden there was this core group, you know, the Pitsnoggle, Sally, Beeline, Gansey, um, that just kind of took you through the next two years. And man, what a hell of a run! I mean, you never felt like you were, were going to lose, even if you were down fifteen, you didn't feel like you were lose with those guys. That Pitt game you referenced, that was a hell of a comeback. That's back when Pitt did not lose at home at Oakland, no. Oakland Zoo. Man, and that was a huge win. I still was a huge win. to this day remember thinking, damn, man, we're getting our ass kicked. And then here they came. Pitts on banging threes, banging threes. I just, just remember they would stick Pitts Noggle up top, and, you know, a center would be guarding him. And he would catch the ball and just so quick would shoot it, swish, swish, swish. If you remember, we ran backdoor cuts and stuff. Yeah. Him being able to pull their center out and open up the rim. I mean, we, yeah. you know, that, that was. You always had – they'd have to go small, too, because they'd have mm-hmm. to put somebody – if they had a real big, slow center, they, he couldn't come out and guard him. So, they'd have to go small, open up the inside, and they ran that back. His, his skill set was perfect for that. Yeah. I think uh, – and he kind of alluded to it. He doesn't know where his career would have been had he stayed under Catlett. I mean, it was the perfect system, the perfect time, just – the perfect combination of everything coming together. So it's good to hear from him. Good to catch up from Kevin. And, uh, and, and like I said, hopefully we can get him down here to Charleston. Maybe we can have like an, a little event and get him here and, and, uh, let him. I'm sure there's still some pits noggled shirts out there.